So in this part, we're going to actually start implementing our DNS server. So here I have what's called an RFC, which is called a request for comments. This was written in 1987, and this is the actual document that describes the implementation of the DNS protocol. You don't have to read it to follow this series, but there are a couple of things I'm just going to mention first. So specifically, this is what I wanted to mention. If you want to send data over the internet, there's two ways you can do it. You can use TCP connections to send data over the internet, or you can use UDP. UDP is a connectionist protocol, and TCP uses connections. TCP has more overhead than UDP, so it's useful when you're sending a large amount of data, because TCP can ensure that every single bit will get to the actual destination. UDP can't guarantee that every packet will get to its correct destination. But for things like DNS, UDP is actually quite useful. Lots of DNS servers don't actually implement UDP, they just implement TCP. But what we're going to be doing is using UDP. The actual DNS specification says if your DNS response or request is less than or equal to 512 octets, which is just a byte. An octet is 8 bits, so uh, 512 bytes is really what this means. So essentially, if your request is less than 512 bytes, we're going to use UDP because it's quicker and it has less overhead. UDP just involves sending a packet to a destination and you don't know if it got there or not, but if the destination is listening for the packet, it will receive it and it can send something back to you. That's what we're going to use to create our DNS server. The actual DNS specification says if your DNS query or response is 512 bytes or less, to send it using UDP for this reason. And if it's more than that, it wants you to send it using TCP. To keep things simple, we're not going to be checking the size of messages and things like that. We're just going to send them over UDP and we're just going to assume they're 512 bytes or less. So with that in mind, what we need to do is create a UDP server essentially. So we're going to go to our text editor and in Python, the way you create a connection using TCP or UDP is you use the socket library. So we're going to say import socket. And then we're going to define a couple of variables. The first one is going to be port, which is going to be equal to 53 because DNS operates on port 53 by default. And that's what we want to operate on. Because if we try to send a request using dig um, to our server, if we're not on port 53, which is what dig is going to think we're on, it's not going to know where to send the request to because it's going to be sending a UDP packet to port 53 on our server. And if our server's not listening on port 53, it's no, it has no way of knowing whether or not a packet was sent. So it can't respond and answer the DNS query. Next, we're going to create another variable called IP, and it's going to be equal to 127.0.0.1. And that's just the IP address of the loopback, which is essentially my computer's IP address to talk to itself. The next thing we need to do is create our socket object. So we're going to call it sock, and we're going to say sock is equal to socket.socket. .socket. And right now, if we try to run this, it's not going to work. We need to provide the socket method with a couple of variables. The first one is socket.af underscore inet. So what that means is it means we want to send our data using IPv4. We can use IPv6 as well, but by default, we're going to be using IPv4 to keep things simple. We have one more parameter to give sock, which is socket.sock underscore dgram. Sock underscore dgram tells Python we want to use UDP instead of TCP. Next, we want to say sock.bind. To use sock.bind, we say IP and port to provide it with the IP address and the port we want it to bind to. But if I run this, we're going to get an error. Because bind takes one parameter, not two. So for some reason, we have to surround these in brackets to create a tuple, which is essentially one parameter with two parameters inside it. I have no idea why they make you do that, but that's what we have to do. And down here, what we want to do is create an infinite loop that will just keep the program running, listening for requests. So we say while one, which means the loop will last forever. And we're going to say data, comma, address, which is edder, is equal to sock.recv from. And here we want to say 512, which means 512 bytes. And if we go back to the web page, you can see they want 512 octets or less. So the reason we have data comma address is because this sock.receive from method returns a tuple and the first item is data and the second is the address that it got it from. And here what we're going to do is just print data. So let's just run this. Let's just close out of that. So we're just going to run this put in the password because we want to use port 53, which means we have to have the administrator permissions. Let's just hit enter. Okay, we have a syntax error, whoops. So this should be a string. Let's run this again. So now our server's running. There's no output yet because it hasn't got any data. So let's just run this again. 
and you can see the dig command has just frozen because we haven't actually sent it any output which means dig is still expecting to receive some output and as you can see dig is just repeatedly sending the request that's why there's three of these now and it's just timed out because it hasn't got a response yet but as you can see here's the three requests let's just close that and these are the raw bytes themselves. Some of them have been converted by the terminal into their ASCII characters, which for example is this word, how code. These are raw bytes. Bytes by Python are represented by backslash X and then some hexadecimal number. But if the terminal can, it tries to convert them into ASCII characters. And that's what it's done here with how code and org. And that's what it's also done up here with the T and then the capital P. That's not actually what was sent back. That just means the terminal was able to convert the byte into a character to output on the screen. But the underlying data is exactly the same. So that's it for this video. Don't forget to like, comment, favorite, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.